It is 6 p.m. Queensland time on this Friday, the 18th of January. Thanks again for stopping by at 28storms.com for another tropical cyclone update. Starting with the latest products from the Bureau of Meteorology, first with the western region, they say that the monsoon over the tropics is likely to develop further over the next week and lead to enhanced rainfall over the Kimberley. A low is developing over land in the West Kimberley, but is expected to remain over land until Monday. This low may develop into a cyclone during the next week, and its potential for development will be monitored over the coming days. Meanwhile, things are starting to heat up across the northern region, including the Gulf of Carpentaria. A weak tropical low at around 1,000 hectopascals is located in the southeastern Gulf near Mornington Island in Queensland, and the low is expected to remain slow-moving over the next day or two and may develop into a tropical cyclone on Sunday if it remains over water. The low is forecast to move further east and move over the Cape York Peninsula on Monday. And you see here down near the bottom on Sunday, there is a high chance of development, meaning there is at least a 50% chance of cyclone formation. Of course, the Coral Sea outlook is highly dependent on what that low over the Gulf decides to do. But as of right now, their latest outlook says that the monsoon trough currently extends from a low over the southern Gulf to the northern Coral Sea. A weak low is expected to develop on the monsoon trough near the north tropical coast during Sunday and is expected to move slowly to the east where it may develop further on Monday. And by Monday, the chances of cyclone formation have been increased to moderate. Since the tropical low is beginning to form in the Gulf, we already see warnings being activated by the Bureau of Meteorology. Currently, there is a coastal wind warning in effect for eastern Gulf waters, and they are warning that some of the wind gusts could exceed 40 knots in the squalls within the monsoon trough, and we also have a severe weather warning in effect, meaning that we could be seeing rainfall rates every six hours in excess of 100 to 200 millimeters, which could cause isolated flooding, and we also have the risk of damaging winds with those gusts sometimes exceeding 90 kilometers per hour. The Joint Typhoon Warning Center has also updated their 24-hour outlook, and they are giving the Gulf low a low chance of development, and they have also outlined a second disturbance currently located to the east of Vanuatu, and this low will also have to be monitored very closely. As a matter of fact, the Fiji Meteorological Services has already designated the Southern Pacific Disturbance as Tropical Depression 9F, and they are giving Tropical Depression 9F a low to moderate chance of additional strengthening over the next two to three days. We will touch more on this feature once we are done with the Australian activity later on in this video. Starting off the satellite imagery with an overall look at the Australian region, we can see that the broad low near the Gulf of Carpentaria is actually centered just to the south of the Gulf at the moment. The center of circulation near the surface appears to be a little more onshore than it is offshore. Therefore, we are not expecting much in the way of strengthening over the next 24 hours, but the Gulf will continue to be the main focus over the next couple of days. We're also going to be paying attention to the Western Australian region because recent model guidance over the past two to three days has been signaling the potential for a dual cyclone threat with potential cyclones threatening both Queensland and Western Australia. However, in the most recent model cycle, the models have backed off somewhat on development near the Pilbara. Upon closer inspection, this is a zoomed in look at the Gulf of Carpentaria low using the 512 kilometer Mornington Island radar, and you can definitely see that cyclonic banding feature starting to take shape out across this region. You've got those northerly spiraling bands of rainfall trickling in into the Cape York Peninsula, and this is why the Bureau of Meteorology has had to issue some warnings for this region, as they will be packing quite a punch, including the threat of isolated rainfall, including the risk of flooding and damaging winds, but as of right now, it looks as though the center of circulation is just inland near or just to the northeast of Westmoreland, and the good news about this is that it is somewhat doubtful that the low will be able to gain much in the way of latitude over the next couple of days. So once again, land interaction is going to be the main detriment to this system trying to get its act together. Otherwise, conditions are favorable for additional strengthening. This is just another view using visible satellite imagery, and there is a lot of disorganized convection here, but as long as that surface low remains relatively weak and halfway onshore, it is going to be very difficult for convection to remain sustained near the center of the circulation for a prolonged period. We're just going to have to wait and see if that surface low can reorganize itself or relocate more onto the coastal waters or potentially even offshore. If that were to happen, then this system should be able to become a Category 1 before continuing east into the Cape York Peninsula. 
Here is a look at the regional water vapor, and we are seeing an improvement in the upper level conditions needed for tropical cyclone development compared to this time yesterday. If you recall in yesterday's video, we were dealing with two powerful upper level lows, one situated near the Queensland coast, but this trough is starting to move a little bit more toward the east, which is allowing the storm to ventilate a little bit better to the northwest as upper level ridging becomes more dominant. And also, the upper level low that was situated over the Northern Territory is no longer discernible. So as we turn to the latest analysis charts, beginning with the upper level divergence, which is favorable, you see that the highest values are over the Gulf. And the wind shear values show that there is an upper level ridge over the southern Gulf of Carpentaria. So that is a favorable setup with very light upper level winds located directly above the tropical cyclone. And all of the strong westerly flow or vertical wind shear is now displaced more toward the south. So once again, it is definitely good news that the surface low and highest concentration of 850 millibar low level vorticity is displaced that far toward the south. Otherwise, if it were currently over the central Gulf, we would be seeing more in the way of steady intensification by now. Either way though, there is still the potential for this storm to become a category one before moving more toward the east. And we also do not want to dismiss some of the long-term potential that we are seeing and we will explain momentarily with a look at some of the latest model guidance. First, however, this is a quick look at Tropical Depression 9F located just to the east of Vanuatu, and TD 9F is not overly strong at the moment. Really, the winds are only about 20 to 35 knots with some isolated convective activity, but interests out across Fiji and Samoa, along with American Samoa, are advised to monitor the progress of this low over the coming days. As you can see on the enhanced infrared, it is still rather disorganized, and based on water vapor imagery, there are still a lot of upper level lows and troughs in the region, so the vertical wind shear values are moderate. So not very conducive conditions, at least in the short term, for additional strengthening. However, the upper level winds do appear to be slightly more favorable to the east of where the center is currently located, and we are expecting a bit of an east-southeast trajectory over the next two to four days. So there is the potential for more intensification, especially beyond 48 hours. Overall, the models are not terribly aggressive with developing this storm into a significant cyclone, but there is definitely some room and time for that to change. But for now, the National Weather Service office in American Samoa is not saying much until they can gain a better handle as to what the disturbance is going to do. All they have on their website is a little snippet from their forecast discussion in the long term. They say that Sunday through Thursday, a ridge of high pressure will continue to provide stable weather during the weekend. However, a tropical disturbance 9F near east of Vanuatu is expected to come near or across the islands by midweek. For now, they will continue to monitor the movement of TD9F while keeping the previous forecast. And finally, we're going to start looking at the most recent model guidance that has become available within the last couple of hours. But don't get terribly excited because this is a rather messy setup that forecasters are going to have to deal with. The models are in a lot of disagreement with each other right now, so there is a lot of uncertainty beyond days two and three. But we're going to go ahead and get started with a look at the latest 0Z run of the GFS model. As we go into 24 and 48 hours, it leaves a remnant area of low pressure across the southern gulf, but it quickly and almost too quickly develops a secondary low in the Coral Sea. And although it is possible to get two areas of low pressure, it is somewhat suspect that it's developing the second area so quickly and several of the other models are holding back and they're keeping more of the activity concentrated closer to the Gulf for a longer duration. So that alone tells you that the GFS solution here is a little suspect, plus the GFS has the tendency to overdevelop areas of low pressure, especially when we're dealing with a lot of convection in the area. Sometimes it can spawn convection and surface lows from that convection, so we are somewhat doubting this latest GFS depiction as of right now. But regardless, it's still important to look at the entire forecast output from all of the models to draw a more accurate conclusion. And as we go into day four, you can see that obviously the upper level conditions across the Gulf are still going to be favorable because any low pressure that is still in that area is likely going to take advantage of those conditions and develop more. But as of right now, the GFS has two separate tropical cyclones. Again, this is somewhat of an unlikely solution. But as we go into day six, you can see the overall steering here. Anything that moves well out into the Coral Sea is likely to continue moving eastward, feeling the effects of troughing out across the South Pacific. But this is telling you that anything that lingers around the Gulf or very close to the Cape York Peninsula is either going to stall out for a few days or start moving back toward the west as the ridge over interior Australia begins to make a comeback. 
And here is a look at the steering in a more detailed fashion. This is the 500 hectopascal steering layer. You can see, once again, more than likely, the erroneous solution of having two tropical cyclones so close to one another. But by day five and day six, you see the ridging make a re making a return toward the south. So that pushes the Gulf cyclone more toward the west into the top end, while the storm out across the Coral Sea is left to continue moving toward the southeast and away from Australia altogether. So here now is what we think will be a more accurate solution. This is the 0z run of the ECMWF. At 24 and 48 hours, the main concentration of low pressure is still situated over the Gulf, but not organizing too terribly fast as it will still be very close to land. As we go into 72 and 96 hours, it starts to move a little bit more toward the east, potentially at this time now a Category 1 cyclone. And as we go into Day 5 and Day 6, it pushes just barely into the Coral Sea, but it's really hugging the Queensland coast. And if this type of forecast verifies with the steering currents breaking down, this is going to be more so of a flooding problem if the low decides to linger directly over the Cape York Peninsula for several days. And that is essentially what the European is showing at least through Day 7. And keep in mind, any forecast through Day 7 is highly subject to change as the models have a very tough grasp on forecasting cyclones beyond even just five days. However, one interesting thing that I would like to point out that is very similar between the GFS and European is the overall steering mechanisms and what they are forecast to do. As we go into 48 and 72 hours, you can see that there's really not much in the way of steering. You don't see any overly amplified troughs out across the Coral Sea. The ridging out across Australia is not terribly strong at this time, and that is the reason why we're not forecasting much in the way of uh, significant speed or movement of the low pressure area in the Gulf for the next 72 hours. And as you can see here, it's not until day four that the European is now pushing the low over the Cape York Peninsula. And if anything, it could be nudged slightly toward the east into the Coral Sea because we do see the ridge at least making a temporary comeback here. The troughing does try to set up across Brisbane and Sydney, but it's only a minor shortwave trough. So instead of being shunted completely toward the southeast, the European shows the low lingering near the Cape York Peninsula through days six and seven. And this is also going to be a major wrench in the intensity forecast as land proximity will still be a major role here if it's a little bit more toward the east over the Coral Sea or a little bit more toward the west over the Gulf, then obviously it would be stronger than what this model is currently depicting. It's just way too far out and too uncertain to tell you anything with a lot of confidence at this time. Also, here's just another quick rundown of a couple other model members. This is the UK Met. As we go into 24, 48, and 72 hours, you can see that the UK Met is also much slower with the eastward progression of the storm. This is in much more agreement with the ECMWF compared to the suspect GFS solution. So this gives us more confidence over the next three to four days. And we also see pretty good support from the latest run of the Canadian CMC model with the low making a very slow track toward the east, moving into the Cape York Peninsula within 72 to 96 hours, and then it lingers near Queensland for the next six days. So it is rather unfortunate that there are more questions than answers at this time, but that is to be expected with a slow moving low that is not really expected to get cranking for at least another 48 hours. And although near the Pilbara the models have backed down a little bit, We've seen just how quickly the models can change, so we're also going to keep that in mind, and we're going to keep a close watch on the models to see if they become more aggressive once again when they update, and we're also going to keep a close watch on that system near Vanuatu for our interests that are monitoring the updates from the Southern Pacific. So stay tuned with your latest updates from the Bureau of Meteorology, and we're going to do the same with continuing to keep you informed here at 28storms.com.